Welcome to Reader Meet Writer Southern Edition featuring Caitlin B. Curtis with her new book, Native. I have my copy right here. <laughs> Identity, Belonging, and Rediscovering God. We hope to provide some retail therapy, entertainment, and distraction during this hour. I'm Wanda with the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance. And now to today's writer, Caitlin B. Curtis and I meant to ask this question, is a citizen, I'm gonna try this because I think I know it, of the Potawatomi Nation. Is that right, Caitlin? Potawatomi. Potawatomi, so much better. Of the Potawatomi Nation, as well as a Christian, public speaker, and poet. She travels around the country speaking on faith and justice within the church, as it relates to indigenous peoples and has been a featured speaker at Why Christian, Evolving Faith, Wild Goose Festival, the Festival of Faith and Writing, the Revolutionary Love Conference, and more. Curtis is a monthly columnist for Sojourners, has contributed to On Being and Religion News Service, and has been featured on CBS, in USA Today and The New Yorker for her work on having difficult conversations within the church about colonization. Caitlin, we're so glad to have you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I thought I would just share a little bit about why I wanted to write this book and then I'm gonna read, do a little short reading from the book. So. Um, I have, my first book was called Glory Happening, and I wrote it in 2016, and it was kind of in this time where I was just starting to sort of deconstruct the Southern Baptist faith that I grew up with. You know, I was just starting to kind of ask questions, but didn't really know what to do with that. The farthest I kind of got was to, you know, think of God more as mystery than sort of the patriarchal idea of like a male figurehead of a God, and so... I wrote that book as I was kind of doing that. And then sort of the next stretch of my journey was to begin really asking questions about my identity. You know, what have I inherited from the faith that I grew up with? And, and that led me to a lot of hard questions and um, asking, you know, where I come from and who I come from and um, how do I want to define myself now? And so Native was just kind of born out of that space of um, coming back to the indigenous voice inside of me that hadn't really been heard in a long time. And then when that happens, what do I do with my Christian faith? And that's a hard question. And so, you know, I processed through writing. <laughs> so I wrote a book about it and I wrote it in hopes that other people who are asking some of these hard questions about identity, you know, you don't have to be native to read it, but I write through my perspective, hoping that other people can understand why identity is tricky and complicated and layered and, why we're on this journey together. And so that's why I wrote it. And, um, you know, it's just an honor to share my stories. You know, I write, it's a, it's just a book full of my experiences and stories in hopes that that draws people in as an invitation to ask some of these hard questions. So I want to read uh, one of the essays to you. So there's like essays within the chapters. And so I'm going to read from one of those essays. If we are responsible to and for one another, that means we are called to ask questions and seek together and to remain tethered all the while. The task of a tribal religion, if such a religion can be said to have a task, is to determine the proper relationship that the people of the tribe must have with other living things and to develop the self-discipline within the tribal community so that man acts harmoniously with other creatures. This statement from Vine Deloria Jr. in his book, God is Red, explains a great deal of the disconnect between indigenous belief and American Christianity as we see it today, and as we have seen it throughout history. The original roots of a connectedness to creation that we find in the New Testament, like the story of Jesus healing a blind man with spit and dirt, are lost on us in America today. We baptize people by manipulating them into faith communities in warm water, 
in our sanctuaries because we do not understand that water is life, that she is our guide. We do not care for this earth. And so as the earth speaks to us with warning signs such as climate change, we do not know how to respond because we don't even see Mother Earth as a living, breathing being that we can learn from. Indigenous peoples are labeled idol worshipers and animists because we have an understanding with the earth and the creatures around us that much of the white Western church has lost. So how do non-native people find a way to understand their roots? Like the ways that St. Francis engaged with and honored and understood the creatures around him. The answer is in the way we choose to value and care for Mother Earth. And if we truly care for her, we will honor the creation stories of all cultures. And we will do the work necessary to change things, decentering white supremacy as a threat to sustainability along the way. My partner taught a Christian ethics class a few years ago at a small Christian college. And when they covered Genesis 1, a young man in the class commented that the main responsibility of people is to subdue the earth, as in overpower and control it by any means necessary. This kind of idea, formed in the belly of toxic masculinity, is passed down generation to generation by Christians who are power hungry, who take advantage of the land and carry on the legacy of their ancestors to take what is not freely given. This idea is what Western settler colonialism has given us. This is how we are disconnected from the voices of the trees and the air of Kiche Minado, the great spirit. May we return to our origin stories and remember. When I travel around the country to speak on my Potawatomi identity and how the church is complicit in so much of the struggle native people have faced in the past and face today, I begin every talk with a land acknowledgement. Essentially, I am naming the traditional people of the land, the original inhabitants who in some cases are still inhabiting these spaces and are caring for the land. And if they have been forcefully removed from the land, I acknowledge that as well. I acknowledge the kindness of the land, the grace with which the land has always cared for us as human beings. Land acknowledgements are a way of looking back to remember and to grieve and to make room for difficult conversations that are still relevant today. In a way, they force us to look at the creation narratives we tell ourselves about this nation. A nation of pull yourself up by your bootstraps, but not a nation of acknowledging the resilience of indigenous peoples. Land acknowledgements cannot be taken lightly and they must be done in the right way. We know that if any practice becomes rote or is done improperly, it may risk losing its meaning. Because land acknowledgements have been common in Canada for a while, many Canadians are talking about whether such acknowledgements are helpful or necessary anymore. It may be that they are losing their meaning or the idea of a settler naming the original peoples of a place without really honoring or learning about those peoples dilutes an important and necessary conversation. But in the US, because we hardly use land acknowledgements, we need to consider their importance in recovering a history that has been covered up. Every time I practice a land acknowledgement, I meet people who tell me they've never heard one before, that it moved them and that it challenged them. Every time I share the native land website on social media or tell people to visit the map and look up who originally inhabited the land they live on, people are amazed at what they find. It's not just knowing about the people who lived on and tended to this land, what we call Turtle Island, but it's about knowing our stories, our beliefs that education comes from the roots up. Our origin stories come from the land because she is our teacher. So our very connectedness to God, sacredness, mystery, and to our identity is in the land. Acknowledging our existence, is acknowledging the existence of Mother Earth. In 2018, we left one part of Atlanta and moved a few miles across town to a new home. In the backyard of our old house was a pine tree that I visited often. I'd lay tobacco at the base of the trunk and pray because this tree reminded me of my grandma Avis. For some reason, an ancestor visited me at this tree when the wind shook her branches with kind laughter, dropping pine cones on my head. I would dodge them smiling, remembering that I am not alone. 
The day we moved, I went to the backyard straight to that tree. I touched her rough skin and I cried and I said goodbye to the spaces the Muscogee Creek people knew, the spaces that remind me of where I come from. I said goodbye and when we arrived at our new home, I quietly walked along the backyard, listening to what our new kin might have to say. The trees are different. A huge water oak sits right beside the back door, right by the fire pit. When we light that fire, we see hawks fly across the sky and stars light up at night. And we remember once again that we are not alone and that everything that has brought us to this moment, all that sacred love has also brought the trees and the dirt and the sky. If we believe that, we must believe that we are here to learn from one another. Land acknowledgement is about listening, about remembering, and about rejecting invisibility. Thank you, that was beautiful. I'm sure you can see people clapping. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I read the book and I loved it. And, and I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions and then we're gonna go to the Q&A. But um, sure. you know, since I've been doing this hard work, I'm getting to go first. Uh, <laughs> so, so the whole time I was reading, I, I was thinking about the experience we're having right now. I mean, could we be any more connected or see our connection than right now with this virus? Uh, and I have thought a lot about this virus and have felt like Mother Earth is trying to tell us something. Like y'all white people are about the worst boyfriend I've had since the dinosaurs. Um, is there any, uh, do, have you, I mean, were you writing the book? This wasn't happening when you were writing the book, but, but as the pandemic has happened, how do you think about it uh, yeah. from your point of view? Yeah, it's actually, it's very interesting that this book was released during this pandemic because the book is about the part of, part of the book is guided by the Potawatomi flood story, which is a story in our culture about creator flooding the earth and then beginning the land again. And, you know, we're not in a flood, but we're in a global pandemic and we're asking what earth and what life will look like on the other side. And, and I just, that never would have been connected except that we're in a global pandemic. So just the story of beginning again and of the turtle and the muskrat, like this really important story um, wouldn't have meant the same except that we're in this pandemic now. And so that's connected so much for me that the earth is asking us like, what kind of humans are we going to be on the other side of this? And how are we practicing connectedness better than we have before? Exactly. And it's, uh, it's been so interesting. Um, and, and I don't want to comment on, I'm not taking a side, but it's been so interesting to see how people have responded every way, every way around yeah. and from feeling like they have, you know, their personal rights versus the rights of taking care of everyone else. And just sort of those are in conflict and it's just interesting to think about it. I also loved how the book looks and how it works. And I'm wondering how much of that was your decision or the publisher's decisions. I love the summaries of, of each section and the poetry openings for the sections. Can you talk about the design and how much of that was yours and how much the publisher had to say about that? And yeah, I am. Um, it's funny because my first book was just a book of essays and prayers. And so when I wrote this one, I was like, okay, this time I need to write real chapters. And I tried to sit down and start writing long chapters and I couldn't do it. Like I write essays, you know? And so you tell a story in an essay, you, you comment on the story and then you move on. Like that's, that's what I know. So I decided the way that I write is I, I build out. So like, if you want to just read one essay, you can, but if you want to read the, the four essays or however many essays within that chapter, you can, and that's a picture. If you want to read all the four chapters within a section, you can read a section at a time, you know, and I just, I really enjoy kind of building it up like that as a whole picture. And I don't know why my brain works that way, but I'd like, I didn't mean to. <laughs> it's just like, when I sat down to draw out the book, that's, that's what it looked like, you know, and thankfully, my publisher let me put in original poetry and the summaries and I that just the poetry really felt like a piece of me and I wanted it to be kind of a breath at the beginning of each section, just to like breathe a little before we get into the hard stuff, you know, and so I'm just really grateful for that. I really liked it. 
I really enjoyed it. Now, would you call this book a memoir or a religious studies book? Um, I call it a memoir, but it, it's kind of tricky. Um, you know, I'm not an academic at all, but um, I, um, I could pass off as an academic sometimes. Um, and so I, you know, I have academic notes, degrees. The notes at the end look like an academic. Yeah. And it's a great reading list. I also yeah. so many great books to read in the back of this that I yes. so and I excited. wanted that to be intentional. I I quote mostly um, mostly indigenous authors because I want people to go and read more, you know, and and learn more. And so that was very intentional as well. It was a great list. I mean, a lot of books in there that I love, and a lot of books that I've never heard of. So I'm very excited um, to have that list. So thank you for that. Um, I would like for you to talk about code switching and passing. I mean, I know what passing is, and I think a lot of folks do, but just in case, and I'm code switching, I think I have an understanding of, but I would love to get clarity from someone who knows more than me. So I would appreciate if you would explain those two words. Yeah, um, so in the book, I talk about being white coded or white passing. And basically that just means that as an indigenous person, I look white. I'm, so if I'm somewhere, uh, I pass as white. I'm not going to be, I would never claim that I'm being discriminated against based on my skin color because I know that I have white privilege. And um, that was a really important thing for me to name in the book is to be honest about that and explain that um, black and brown natives face discrimination that I won't face and I need to be um, making sure that I'm speaking up about that because it, that's a real, very real thing. Um, so that's like being white coded or white passing <clears throat> code switching either with language where you're literally like you, you know, different languages and you're having to switch back and forth. Also in my mind, code switching can be identity switching as well. Like you go into a space and you know that all of you won't fit there and won't be accepted there. And so you hide parts of yourself to fit in. And so like for me, um, being in the church is often a hard place for me because I feel like not all of me can come in the door. And, um, and so you end up trying to figure out how you can maneuver who you are to fit in better, if that makes sense. It does make sense, because in the book, you talk about having a coffee mug. Yeah. It had a message on it. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, from my tribe. Mm -hmm. and that you didn't know if you should take into yeah. a church event. I don't know if it was the actual church, but with some yeah. church friends or doing something, and you had second thoughts. Mm -hmm. and were like I'm taking it <laughs> yeah. You know yeah. What yeah. yeah I'd wear shirts that said thing indigenous things on them and I knew a lot of people didn't even know what the word indigenous meant so it was right. it was always just interesting <laughs> very interesting the other thing I like about this book is it's full of questions and I'm only going to take uh, one more minute y'all and then we're going to give the questions over to y'all so I just want to pick a couple of the questions um and just have you kind of talk about the questions. Okay. So how do I reckon with this? I call myself a Christian, and yet how do I reckon with settler colonial Christianity that is influenced by empire? Yep. <laughs> um, you know, I, it's very tricky to be indigenous and have ties to Christianity, and I'm well aware of that. And um, the reality is if you grow up with a certain faith, it's hard to just like turn it off and be done with it. And so there is this journey that I'm on at least right now to ask like, you know, can Christianity look different than what it has? Like, can I decolonize this faith? And the honest answer is I don't know, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not sure, but it's the journey I'm on right now. And I think it's the journey a lot of people are on is asking can we separate out those bits of Christianity that are so muddied up with empire and colonialism? Like, can that be separated out? And I wanted to ask that of the reader, you know, can we do this? Is it possible? I'm not sure. I don't have the answer. I just want to ask the question. And is it only tricky in one direction for you? Is there any in the native community? Are they troubled by your Christianity? I mean, yeah, some, so a lot of natives understandably don't want anything to do with Christianity and I completely respect that. And so I know, and I'm kind of on the periphery of Christianity. So a lot of Christians are comfortable with me. So I live in this weird liminal space where I, I know that, that I make some people uncomfortable and, and that's just the conversation that we have to have, you know? 
So well, I, you make me very comfortable. I just want to say that. Um, Linda Marie, I think we're ready for some questions. If you'll unmute yourself and take the and take the first question from the crowd, I'd appreciate it. All right. Um, where did the Potawatomi Nation originate? Uh, so we originally lived in the Great Lakes region of the United States. And I write about in my book, um, there's a group of Potawatomi people in 1838. There was a forced removal from Indiana to Kansas called the Trail of Death. So you can Google the Trail of Death. And I talk about this in my book. Um, there was this forced removal of a group of us to um, Kansas and we lived there we were forced there, lived there, and then some of us moved to Oklahoma, which is where I was born. So my my band of the Potawatomi are in Oklahoma, but there are still Potawatomi people, Anishinaabe people in the Great Lakes region as well. We're kind of spread out. <laughs> um, another person who's a fan of Quail Ridge books asks, what books would you recommend for a preschool Sunday school class that will teach the kids to understand nature, creation, and land acknowledgement? Oh, that's a good question. Um, oh gosh, kids books. Okay. So there's, um, there's a beautiful book that's called Bow Wow Pow Wow that, uh, um, by Brenda Child. Um, it's just a beautiful kind of story about a about powwows and for us powwows are a sacred place of connecting to the land and so that's one that i would recommend um i really like the mishomis book that's one that i uh, read a lot to my kids also okay this will be easier because i it's hard for me to think of things um go to my my website caitlincurtis.com and i have two book lists on my website books by indigenous authors where um there's some kids books and some adult books so there's a, a large list there that you can find, two different lists. Uh, the next question, another fan of Quail Ridge books, do you have daily practices for connection with the earth, spirituality, and those that were here before us? Um, I, don't, I don't know that I would have like a daily practice I do every day. Um, I mean, we try to go outside every day, like that's important just to go outside and be outside. Um, you know, there are practices that I do as an indigenous person to connect to the land that are personal to me and to my family. Um, but I would say like, um, just trying to get outside. And if you can't get outside, if that's not possible for you, um, trying to just reconnect, like connect to different ideas of the earth, like a book, there's a book called Braiding Sweetgrass, um, by Robin Wall Kimmerer. That's a really beautiful way of just like reorienting the way that you think toward the earth and toward the creatures of the earth that I think even if you can't go outside often, that's one that can help you just like reorient yourself, if that makes sense. How would you go about introducing native theology and native spirituality to a Christian faith community? Um, I would just give them my book. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, that's just my book is it's all in here. Okay. And that's my, this is my journey. You know, you can read um, on those book lists. Again, there are stories from indigenous authors who are Christians. And so if, if that's theology. But what I also say a lot is um, that you don't have to read from indigenous people who are Christians to understand. Like I encourage people to actually read from indigenous people who are not Christians to understand who we are as indigenous people. And, you know, and I don't speak for all indigenous people. And so this is just my journey. And so you have to just read from different people from different nations to try to kind of understand that. So. Another viewer writes, we're studying baptism now. And I love what you've mentioned about it as you've learned about more about your Potawatomi roots. Can you talk more about how discovering that part of your identity has reinforced or enriched the idea of baptism? Yeah, um, I thought a lot about how um, how different it is to be, if you practice baptism, to be baptized out in water than inside in a, in a what is it called, baptismal, where the water is nice and warm and it's like, but to be outside in a river or in a lake, um, to be connected with the land like that, you know, in my tribe, women are water protectors. And so, um, 
you know, to us, water is life. Like it is, it is the life force of all of us. And so we are called to protect it. Um, right now, I don't know what my personal beliefs on theology of baptism are. That's, those are some of those things that I'm working through and trying to understand what I even believe about it. Um, but I do believe that water is sacred and that um, connecting to the water and connecting to creator is a really important thing. How is the spiritual part of your people similar to the Cherokee people who were removed to Oklahoma as well via the Trail of Tears? So I mentioned the, the Trail of Death removal. And um, I think that what's most important, you know, in understanding that is that the government has tried time and again and still continues to try to remove us from our land. Um, as, and that is an act of oppression because we are tied to our languages and tied to our land. Um, you know, when boarding schools, so there are native boarding schools as a part of our history that we don't talk about very often. Um, boarding schools, you know, working hand in hand, the government and the church trying to assimilate and cut out all the parts of our culture as they possibly could was a way to continue to push us further and further away from who we were in hopes that we would deny that or forget it or be wiped out in that case. And, um, and so tribes have their own stories of removal, whether it's physically being removed or removed from their culture or removed from their language. Like we are doing that work of trying to retain and reclaim and hold on to who we are because it's just a constant sort of removing, trying to remove us from um, who we are. Like the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe right now is trying to hold on to land that is trying to be taken from the US government right now in the midst of all of this. And that just continues to happen. And so there is this constant force of trying to remove and we have to constantly fight back against that. Another, another viewer writes, your first book, Glory Happening, Save My Soul in the Beginning of My Faith Deconstruction. Any tips on passing on a deconstructed Christian faith to my biracial daughter? Oh, wow. That means a lot. Thank you. Um, you know, I am, um, it's so tricky. Um, you know, we don't, uh, we don't go to church right now. And so trying to figure out like, what, what do we want our children to know and understand? And what I've, for me, what I've come to is that it's, <clears throat> it's important for my kids to know who they are and, as indigenous people and in their identity to be fully aware of that, because if they decide to be Christians and grow up Christians, like that's, that's fine. They, they get to decide that, but I want them to be grounded in their identity as who they are. And the scary and sad thing is that sometimes in the church, those parts of our identity get drowned out and pushed out. And so for us, like reclaiming, is there a way for us to reclaim who Jesus is as someone who just, fights for the oppressed and stands up against injustice. Like that's, that's kind of at the forefront of our minds is like trying to figure out who that Jesus is, whether we're in church or not. And, you know, I, since I, I have kids who are mixed, like allowing them to fully embrace all of who they are and not have one part or the other part silenced or, you know, not knowing who they are um, has been really important to me. And I think, just having honest conversations about that with them. I mean, it depends on how young, you know, my kids are six and eight, so we're not having a ton of like deep conversations about that yet, but, um, but we want them to be rooted in who they are and to somehow work to sort of decolonize along the way. And it's so hard, but I think it requires listening to diverse voices and, you know, widening our circles like with, with our children and allowing them to see that, if that makes sense. I think that's all the audience's questions, Wanda. Oh, wait. We have another one. How can we work on decolonizing our spaces? Yeah. Um, one, the first thing that I think is really important is that decolonizing is a journey. Like, you know, it's not like we flip on a switch and we're decolonized and that's great. We did it. I think that it's a lifelong journey, no matter how old you are, no matter who you are. Um, I never want to give the impression that like, once we start, we're good. You know, um, this is something we're always going to be learning and trying to figure out. Um, but I think, I think starting from the knowledge of 
specifically in America, like where we started from, you know, we've, we've been educated to have certain beliefs about this nation and about indigenous people and about other people of color, you know, like we've been told a certain narrative and um, challenging those narratives starting there, I think allows us to then begin to ask, okay, so what about my spaces or the institutions I'm in or the way I speak about certain people? Like, how do I need to change that? And so beginning with, you know, unlearning or relearning or re-educating ourselves about some of these really difficult topics, I think is really important because if we don't do that, then we don't know why we're decolonizing. If we don't do that, we don't know what the point of decolonizing is. Like we need that foundation before we begin the work, if that makes sense. And so, you know, unlearning and relearning those things, I think is really important. And to do it with a community, if you can, you know, you don't have to do it alone. Have a space that's safe where you can process and try to figure that out, you know, together, I think is really important too. What have you enjoyed reading recently? Oh, goodness. Um, I always forget things when I'm asked this question. Um, oh, okay. So here's, um, there's a book called um, Women Who Run With the Wolves by Dr. Clarissa Pinkola Estes, which I just tell everyone to read. And I'm not even finished it. I can only read a little at a time. Um, it's so good. Um, and then um, I really enjoyed uh, Barbara Brown Taylor's new book, Holy Envy, just because it really reflects a lot of what I am feeling and understanding as well. And Barbara actually endorsed my new book, um, which was wonderful of her. Um, so her, her new book as well. And then Braiding Sweetgrass, I'll just say again, please read Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer is um, a book that just has changed so many people's lives, um, including mine. So she's, she's also Potawatomi. She's a citizen of my tribe as well. And it's just amazing. Do you have favorite fiction writers that are speaking to this tension between indigenous spirituality and Christianity? Um, I don't read a lot of fiction, um, but I would say one fiction book that you could read is There, There by Tommy Orange. Um, mm -hmm. That I think just gave a really beautiful and raw like picture of sort of Indian country and indigenous people um, that I found really moving and helpful as an indigenous woman. A viewer asked for a little more clarification on decolonization. Oh, sure. Um, okay, so there's certainly more of um, an academic view of what decolonizing might mean, like, like breaking down systems of colonization. So that's, there are definitely more academic sort of ways to interpret that. Mine is not, not so academic, um, but it is just, you know, we, um, whether we recognize it or not, we need to recognize that America is a colonized institution. So America itself is built on colonization. So, you know, the overpowering of indigenous peoples were pushed out and erased and attempted to be wiped out through the building of this nation. And then that carried forth in enslaving black peoples. And, you know, so we have this legacy of colonization and decolonization is recognizing the legacy of these things and working to kind of deconstruct some of those things. So American Christianity, white Christian spaces often are colonized where white supremacy is at the center, whether we recognize that or not, it's there. It can be very um, under the radar. It doesn't have to be, you know, explicit to be there. And so we're asking questions of our institutions, you know, asking questions of consumerism or capitalism, you know, like right now we're asking these questions. We're in the middle of this pandemic and, you know, what are, what institutions are caring for the poor? Like we, we are not equitable. Like there are populations of people who are suffering from this pandemic and we're not caring for them. So then that leads you to asking, okay, like then what's wrong and what, what are we doing and how did we get here? And so decolonizing is just going on that journey of examining. Like I think we just need to take a lot of time to examine what we participate in, examine some of these things. Like I participated in a lot of Southern Baptist missions trips when I was younger and this idea of saving people and changing them to be more like the Christ that we thought was what they needed to be. And so for, that's one of part of my journey is decolonizing the way that I understand how we're supposed to care for other people and approach people 
you know, not thinking of the world as like you're saved and you're not saved or this place is dark and this place is light. Um, you know, trying to break apart some of those things and examine why we believe them and what's wrong with believing that way. So Caitlin, so one of the things in the book that, I mean, you, you help, I want you to help me know that that felt kind of, uh, brave and towards this idea is your native ID can, which I had no idea about that. I mean, I was fascinated to learn about that, but can you tell that story about how that, why you used it and, and what happened about the airports? That's Uh Okay. Um, yeah. So because I'm a citizen of my nation, I have a tribal ID. Um, there are nations that, there are people who are parts of nations who aren't able to have tribal IDs for various reasons, but I have, I have a tribal ID um, that I can use at airports. So there in the, the TSA guidelines, there's a line there that, that tribal IDs are a form of identification that is valid. And so um, I started using my tribal ID a few years ago uh, when I started traveling, which now I don't, even know if they take them because the laws may have changed. But, um, you know, because I am white passing, you know, I could walk through that line with my normal ID and no one would know I was indigenous. There's nothing about me that cues that unless I have braids and earrings and some people might say something, but there are certain stereotypes, right? That people are like, Oh, are you native? Um, but I started using my ID and it was really difficult because as soon as you hand them that, it changes the way people think of you automatically. Like you can see the stereotypes just like filtering through their brains. And uh, it didn't matter what city I was in. I've had maybe two or three positive experiences where someone was like, that's so awesome that you're indigenous. Most of the experience were the opposite of that. And so recognizing, you know, one that like I need to do this because it is a way of showing people that we're still here and two, doing it because I am white passing. Like I know that my friends who are black and brown natives who use their IDs are going to be treated far worse than I am and recognizing their stories and the things that they have gone through just to get through TSA. And we're all, we're all using our IDs in that way because it's sort of a form of, you know, resistance of standing up and saying, we're still here and, and this is us and we want you to see us and to understand that it's important that we're still here. Um, but it's, it's very, um, like I write about how I start sweating as soon as I get in the line because I don't like confrontation. And so knowing that I'm going to get up there and I'm going to be that they're, that whatever kind of way that they're looking at me, it's going to change right away. And if it's positive, it's going to turn negative pretty quickly. And I've known that to be true many times. And so yeah, it's really hard. It's hard. Um, but it's been a really important thing for me. It's just something that's really meant a lot to me. And I guess for the reason I was asking is because it feels like work towards decolonization. Yeah. And I guess to me. Yeah. Um, and I also love the story about the one TSA person who said, Oh, I don't need to find the expiration date because you're forever. You're forever. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think we've reached the end of our time. If we don't have another question from the audience, I, and I could ask tons of questions. I hope everyone will buy this book and read it because it is very thought provoking. And I, learned so much and i appreciate you so much caitlin Uh, it was a brave book thank you so much it's a very brave book thank you um thank you everyone this was wonderful and if you enjoyed it as much as i did let your bookstore know and order the book from them we hope to be scheduling more authors so please be in touch with your bookstore with any suggestions or ideas for how this could have been better for you and order native from them. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you, Linda Marie and Nikki. This is Wanda signing off. Thank you so much.